I'm a pediatric neurologist at heart uh, and as, as, as a job. And so our, our work is really centered around uh, working with patients with early onset neuromuscular disease and particular congenital muscular dystrophies. And that's what we've been doing for oh, two decades now. And, and the um, our focus of our work is to be understanding um, the clinical implications, understanding outcome measures, uh, optimizing care, uh, looking uh, then next into treatment and how to bring treatments to um, our patients and how to uh, get ready for treatment. Um, so I think we're in an exciting time where all of this is going to come to fruition, I think, for us as a, as a field and a community. And with me here is Dr. Regan Foley, who is a, a senior research staff clinician uh, with, with us at the NIH. And she's devoted her career also to the congenital muscular dystrophies, and she'll be presenting along with uh, me. Um, so are we um, presenting our talks now or waiting? I, I think Nicole is presenting first, right? Sorry, uh, you off to present now, Mr. Binnemann, and okay. we have... Um, Okay, so um, what we'll be doing in the next um, 13 minutes or so is to talk to you about um, the work to get uh, ready for clinical trials in, uh, in, in our community of LAMA2 related dystrophies. I'm just trying to, okay, here we go. So just to uh, lay the groundwork for that, um, I, I just wanna make sure we're all on the, on the same page in terms of the terminology that we'll be using in, in this condition. Um, so you uh, hear the terminology of LAMA2 related dystrophies and then also of Maris deficiency. And uh, as you probably all know, but I just wanted to kind of um, set the stage for that. LAMA2 is the gene for laminin alpha 2. So um, the mutations that cause this condition are in the gene for LAMA2. And LAMA2 encodes for a part of mericin. And mericin is this big um, cross-shaped molecule here in the matrix, and it's composed of three different chains, the alpha-2 chain, that's where the mutations are in, but also a beta-1 and gamma-1 chain that is different genes. And all of that together is called the mericin, or laminin-211. So when we talk about mericin, we're not talking about lama-2, the gene, we're talking about this entire assembled protein. That is mericin or laminin-211. However, the mutations are only in this lama-2 gene. Um, so it's important to kind of try to keep the two uh, separate because we are often using them interchangeably, but um, I think it's important to understand what we talk about when we talk about therapies uh, what is a gene and what is a, uh, a protein. And because um, mericin is this entire thing, laminin-211, so our alpha-2 chain and the beta-1 and the gamma-1 chain, um, that is the thing that people have been looking at in the muscle biopsy using antibodies. Um, that's where the terminology comes from, mericin deficiency, using an antibody, staining in muscle and looking for this entire protein, uh, the mericin, the laminin-211. And that's where um, the first discoveries were made that there are patients who have no mericin here as uh, labeled in the muscle biopsy. And those were called complete mericin deficiency. So the entire 211 thing was missing, uh, even though the mutations are only in the LAMA2 chain. So that's important to understand. Uh, but let's um, use this terminology for now to just kind of identify again uh, what um, type of uh, conditions we are talking about. So the classic complete mericin deficiency, that is the classic typical phenotype for LAMA2 related dystrophy. And that is the most common uh, of the um, phenotypes that we see in the spectrum of conditions, the complete deficiency. So no staining with the antibody in the muscle, no protein there. And that's um, where children are affected right at birth. Um, so when I say affected right at birth, it means that the onset of the condition surely is before birth. So this is a condition that is evident at birth and hence the onset starting during development and before birth. 
in a, a typical child with a complete deficiency of the merosin, independent walking is not typically achieved. There are rare exceptions to that. Uh, and then we have also problems with the joint, progressive joint contractures, progressive respiratory insufficiency, and also a mild involvement of the motor nerve, uh, not the muscle, the motor nerve that we don't quite understand yet as to significant that is for the disease itself. We also see in the brain MRI an abnormality of the white matter that is not a leukodystrophy. So it's not a breakdown of white matter. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it doesn't seem to be causing any neurological impairment from the brain, uh, but it means higher water content in the white matter. And some children have a difference in brain formation itself, particularly in the back of the brain, so back here um, where vision is controlled. And, and from that region, 30% may develop seizures. The reason why I'm showing all of this is because we need to be aware of all these clinical problems right at birth and later on when we try to design outcome measures for our clinical trials, when we try to understand the natural history of this disease. And the natural history of this disease really starts before birth. Uh, and then we have to find measurements, how to find um, ways to measure the impact of all of these clinical consequences of a complete deficiency of merosin. As I said, the mutations are in the LAMA2 gene. And the type of mutation that you find in the LAMA2 gene here are mutations that prevent the protein from being made um, so those are loss of function mutations. So no protein is being made from either one of the two copies that we have from mom and dad to make uh, the LAMA2 protein to form the merosin, complete deficiency. And here you see um, two uh, lovely children um, that have this condition, the complete deficiency of the merosin, loss of function mutations in the alpha-2 gene. And you can see um, these, both of these children have achieved the ability to sit. Um, they've been able to use standards. They have not been able to move um, and walk independently. Um, but they have uh, now achieved some head control. They have some use of the um, useful use of the arms that are very important to consider in outcome measures. And when we think about treatments, uh, uh, typically, though, children are not able to completely reach above the head. Um, but they have a lot of workspace, if you will, in front of them using uh, making good function of the arms. And you can see how important it, it is to preserve that function and also preserve um, uh, the uh, range of mobility of the upper extremity to so prevent contractures. Um, just, just for the medical aficionados here um, on the call, you can see this is the white meta abnormality that we see uh, in the brain of these children, but it's not a breakdown of white matter. It's an increased water content of white matter. So it's a bit more loosely packed. It doesn't seem to be impairing the function of the white matter very much. And then we have um, this um, condition that uh, is referred to frequently as partial merosin deficiency. What that means is, so when you take your antibody and you stain the muscle for the merosin, you find there's some merosin there, not as much as, uh, as normal, but there is some protein being made that is there. And the mutations again are in the LAMA2 um, gene, but one or at least one of the two mutations allows for some protein to be made. Uh, which is not completely normal. It is a mutation in the protein, but it allows for some protein to be deposited and hence some merosin to, to be made. And the phenotype, the clinical condition is considerably milder frequently compared to the complete merosin deficiency. There are some children with partial merosin deficiency that have a severe disease, but typically it is uh, milder and often these children will actually allow, um, uh, get to walking independently. And now we know there are even milder patients out there, even adults where the disease is only recognized in adulthood. So the spectrum goes really to the very mild cases. Um, there is still, however, progressive weakness and joint contractures. And again, this mild motor neuropathy that we don't quite know how much impact it has. The white meta abnormality is much more subtle, but it is there uh, and seizures are still possible. Uh, so why, that is why is that important? Because now we need outcome measures also for these patients. Um, so these outcome measures need to be able to measure uh, walking ability and the strengths of walking, um, but also um, the joint contractors uh, and the uh, later ages in which this can occur. It's also a piece of good news here because it means if you have just some protein here, even if it's only partially function, that alone is able to shift the phenotype to a milder one. And that for us as clinicians, it's always 
very important to understand that even if we move the goalpost slightly, if we just make some more protein available um, to the muscle, we have a chance of uh, making this disease milder. Uh, so we don't have to be perfect in, uh, in, in, in our treatments. We can move the goalpost towards the milder. That's our hope. And I think this, um, this also would support that this is possible. So as we prepare for clinical trials, there are three important goalposts here, three important things that we have to consider. One is to optimize and standardize clinical care. Clinical care is enormously important, has huge impacts on, on life and functionality. And so I'm not talking about gene therapy or fancy medications, uh, just proper clinical care that takes into uh, account all of the um, aspects of this disease that one has to pay attention to and from contractures to seizures to respiratory involvement. And that's important so that in clinical trial, every child uh, and every patient that starts in a clinical trial starts from the same optimal point so that we can um, address and measure what impact our additional therapy that we're testing in the trial has. Next, we need to identify outcome measures. And the outcome measures are, are measuring tools to say, uh, and convince ourselves, convince our patient population, convince the regulatory authorities that we're actually doing something that changes the disease. For that, we need to have objectifiable outcome measures that are nonetheless meaningful for the disease. And these outcome measures have to be designed so that they are age and disease stage appropriate. So they have to cover a young infant with this disease that's not able to sit yet, perhaps, uh, to a young child who's sitting but not walking, to a young adult who's uh, perhaps able to walk or not walk. And so we have to identify outcome measures that help us cover the entire spectrum of clinical possibilities so that every person with LAMA2 deficiency can be enrolled in a clinical trial. And these measurements have to be reproducible and they have to be sensitive to change. So we have to measure if we change the disease cause, that has to be obvious in the measurement that we use. And then the third pillar of this is to study the natural history. Uh, so we know what under optimal care conditions and what the natural history of this condition is. And that's important so that we can power our clinical trials with the fewest patient numbers Possible. And that doesn't mean that we don't want to enroll patients, but we want to make a full, take full advantage of um, patients that are available and willing to participate in clinical trials around the world. And every center has only a few patients following actively at the center. Um, so we have to make sure that we can um, know the disease well enough that we can study fewer patients with fewer placebo controls, if you will. So um, there, we want to have uh, trial designs um, available to us that allow for the most number of patients to be actually treated, but still that we have um, sufficient controls to convince ourselves uh, and uh, the regulatory authorities that we are making a change in the natural history of this disease. And so we can do that by comparing to natural history data or even to the patient's own run-in data. So the year before the treatment even started, how has that patient been doing and how is the patient doing after the treatment? And that only works, this type of um, uh, approach only works if we have very solid natural history data that allows for that to be convincingly demonstrated. So for that, we need studies. We need um, studies to identify outcome measures and natural history at all ages. So we've done some homework here with, uh, um, of course, um, a number of you involved and in particular shout out to QCMD. Uh, who has made this possible, and that's already published, uh, which is a completed outcome measure study um, that uh, covers the ages of four to 20 year, uh, two years. And I hand it off to Dr. Foley here to explain what we did. Thank you, Dr. Bonham. And so we, we did at the NIH initially a two-year pilot study, bringing in patients with lamotrilate dystrophy and call 6 way dystrophy, and then expanded the study for three more years. So a total of five years of data collection but again, these were children that were four to 22 years and not less than four years of age, but a very important study that we used to, again, identify which outcome measures would be reproducible and able to measure change over time. We used multiple motor scales, including the MFM32 motor scale, myometry, goniometry for measuring the angles of the joint contractures. We used pulmonary function testing, which can be done reliably in children over five years of age. And we also did quality of life assessments uh, that, that patients and families completed. 
from that study, what we found in terms of those measures which were statistically significant for patients that are non-ambulatory, not walking with lambda 2 related dystrophy, we found that the rate of decline in the MFM32 scale was that of 2.16 points per year. So that was really a very good scale for capturing motor change annually in patients with lambda 2 related dystrophy who are non-ambulatory. In myometry, which is basically measuring the strength of individual muscles, it was less helpful in terms of statistical significance of measuring change over time. However, in knee flexion or bending at the knee using the hamstring muscles, that was statistically significant, a decrease of 2.47% per year. Now, goniometry is very difficult to do um, uh, basically and, and measure well the contracture uh, angles, but um, we did uh, detect that in the elbow extension on the left side, there was significant change there, 4.11 degrees per year. And in this study, pulmonary function testing did not uh, demonstrate statistically significant changes in those patients in this study, but it was a smaller study than the, this next study. So this next study you see here, the force phytic capacity was studied in patients ages five years up to 30 years of age in an international study at six neuromuscular centers, a total of 64 patients. And again, it is easier to do pulmonary function testing reliably in children over, four, over five years of age. So in this study, we could see, if you look at the green line, the non-ambulatory patients with Marison deficiency that are on non-invasive ventilation demonstrated a decline of approximately 1.5% per year. So that's very helpful data for us to know going forward in terms of the natural history of pulmonary function. But again, children over five years of age. Next slide. So now we're focusing on gathering more data in young children, so between birth and five years of age, because we don't have a lot of data in young children. And so we're launching a study which is called the Lambda 2 Related Dystrophy Early Outcome Measures and Natural History Study, or LEON. This will again look at patients' birth to five years of age with visits every six months at a neuromuscular center and in between visits, so uh, three months after your in-person visit and three months before your next in-person visit, a video visit to assess interim changes and interim clinical history. We'll, we'll, we'll be collecting this data prospectively, looking at clinical history, physical examination findings, looking at cardiac function by screening with an ECG electrocardiogram. Of course, if findings on the ECG indicate need for further testing, that would be performed. But we'll start with the ECG testing in young children. And then respiratory function testing is complicated in children less than five years of age, but we're going to attempt to do what's called transcutaneous cabinography, which is basically measuring carbon dioxide with a little bit of a probe on the finger or under the nose to see if we can capture any changes in this young age group. Swallowing oral motor assessment tools are still being um, determined. Next slide. I am trying to advance here. There we go. Nope. In terms of motor function scales, this is kind of tricky in young children, but we're going to use a group of scales to be able to gather well changes in motor function over time in this young age group. So for between birth and 18 months of age, we have an excellent scale known as the CHOP and 10 scale. In children older than two years of age, we can use the MFM 20, but we also use other scales uh, together to be able to capture, again, these very important changes in motor function, which are changes which we would hope would capture any potential improvement in a clinical trial. So be able to have viable outcome measures in young children. Next slide. So in order to do this, we have uh, basically been so fortunate to have a wonderful collaboration. It's a testament of the devotion of patient and family organizations and neuromuscular clinicians around the world. And so we've had um, multiple virtual meetings to help coordinate this what we call a LAMA2 consortium. And we are going to be launching this LEON study, the prospective natural history study in children birth to five years of age of Marison deficiency, beginning initially for the pilot study at 10 centers internationally with the goal to expand to further centers. Um, and so far we've had wonderful uh, a group of, uh, uh, again, patient and family organizations. We have Vor Sarah has been very involved in Pulsate, here's CMD, and also support from Prothelia some support also from Santhera in helping this initiative. And we have colleagues from around the world, including, as you heard from, from Carline, the group there, um, and um, 
Nicole Bormans and Naima Hen are, have already launched their study, but we're trying to figure out a way where we can collaborate and gather all this data together and use it to help uh, in push forward progress towards clinical trials and our clinical trial readiness. So we, of course, most importantly, this would not be possible without the children around the world and their families with Marison deficiency who remain our inspiration every day and for whom we hope to have therapies available in clinical trials soon. Thank you uh, for your wonderful contributions, both of you. Uh, I think very insightful for most of the participants. I see that there were a couple of questions due to time constraints. I don't think we'll have time for all of them, but to pick two. Uh, one is about the white matter abnormally. Is this, uh, is this something that happens to all MDC1H patients or not, Mr. Benema? Uh, yes, so it is, uh, it, it really literally, um, is a diagnostic hallmark that always is there, in particular in the children with complete marison deficiency, so um, while we have no being, protein being made. It, sometimes it's difficult to pick up on the MRI scan when the infants are very young because the white matter isn't mature yet, but as the white matter gets more and more mature, it becomes, the difference becomes more and more evident, um, so that it is um, there uh, in, in every patient, the milder the disease. So um, if we have mutations that allow for some protein to be made so that it's partial deficiency, the less obvious it is, and it can be very subtle. It sometimes decreases a little bit in appearance over the years, um, but it, uh, it is um, really uh, quite co consistent. And it has a very typical pattern that uh, physicians who know the disease will recognize um, so that not all white matter is involved, but only the loose white matter, not the dense white matter. Uh, and, uh, and again, the functional impairment from this is really not, not there. It, it is more a radiological marker than, um, than a clinical um, deficiency, if you will. And another question is, does this research also impact or help adult patients with the disease? Well, is, can you repeat the question? Yeah, will this research also help adults oh, yeah. who have to end? Yes, yeah, so, so the idea behind all of these therapeutic developments is to um, help all um, people affected by this condition in all its varieties. So from the very severe infantile form, to the much milder now recognized limb girdle muscular dystrophy form that occurs in adulthood. Um, all of this is um, the same family, a uh, same family of diseases. And yes, they present differently at the different ages with different impairments and different problems, but the underlying problem is the same. So um, therefore uh, we are very hopeful that um, whatever therapy uh, works out the best and the earliest should be available and should be applicable across the age range. And that's why we want to be um, clinical trial ready at any age uh, and at any um, clinical um, uh, specialty, clinical impairment. Yeah, that's why we have you. a consortium for pediatric neurologists and adult neurologists such as Dr. Fuhrman's. Um, so we, um, we don't want to be exclusive here. I think it's the family. And there, as a final question, can the white matter be related to developing seizures? So that's, thank you, that's a really good question and probably not. I'll explain to you why. So um, in, uh, I mentioned on one of the uh, slides that in some children, and it's actually a higher percentage than we thought before, when you look very carefully, there's actually a difference in how the brain is formed, how the gray matter, not the white matter, how the gray matter is formed in the brain, in particular back here in the uh, parts of the brain that control vision. And in some children, maybe as many as 25 to 30 percent of the complete marison deficiency children, you look very carefully, you see that the brain back there is differently formed. It just looks different on the MRI, a different development of the gray matter there. Now, because the brain is so young uh, and so, so uh, a plastic, you'll never see a visual impairment in the children because the brain has remapped anything that belongs there to differently well-functioning uh, parts of the brain. So there's no visual impairment or anything, but it is a nidus, it is a generator, a potential generator of seizures back there because of the brain wiring being different. And probably the wiring back there can be different even if it looks on the MRI to be quite normal with the limited resolution of the MRI. And interestingly, when you look and talk to patients who have these type of seizures, uh, you often find um, that these seizures 
have um, their complex partial seizures and there may be sometimes an aura, a warning from the seizure. And often that aura, that warning from the seizure is visual in nature. So I remember one young woman who told me she, she sees a big red balloons floating by and then the seizure hits. That tells you that, um, that the seizure really origins from the parts of the brain that control vision. When the seizure starts, you get visual phenomena and then the seizure can encloud the consciousness and become more widespread. Um, but uh, so in other words, it's the wiring of the gray matter that's responsible for the seizures and not the abnormality of the white matter.